All right, well, welcome. Um, this is lesson three of the Beginner's Python Lessons sponsored by the DISC office. And today we're going to talk just a little bit about um, about uh, object-oriented Python. But before we do this, I want to mention um, one thing that uh, is a useful thing to know is, and that is how to make comments. So I think we saw in some of the earlier examples that if you begin a line with the hash character, then everything that follows that character on the line will basically be ignored. So this is a great way for you to leave messages to yourself explaining how your code works. I know that seems kind of silly, but I often, even a week after I've written code, a lot of times I can't remember what I was trying to do with it. And so if you mark your code up with comments, that's always very useful. The other thing is um, how you can make multi-line uh, comments. And so with multi-line comments, there, there isn't actually an official way to do that in Python, but you can sort of simulate a multi-line comment by using triple uh, single quotes. <clears throat> and so what Python actually does is it interprets it as a multi-line string. So it is actually a way to create multi-line strings. So if you want to take several lines of text and assign it to a variable, you can enclose it in, sing, uh, in three single quotes, and then it'll assign that whole blob of text with the new line characters and everything as a single string. Uh, but if you don't assign it to anything, then basically Python ignores it, which is why you can use it as sort of like a multi-line comment. And one of the reasons why this is useful is sometimes when you're debugging code um, you're and you're trying to figure out what isn't working right, you want to comment out a whole block of text and tell Python basically, ignore this part, I don't want you to do this part. And so the uh, triple single quotes is a way, uh, a convenient way to do that. A lot of times code editors will have a method for applying hash characters to a whole bunch of lines, like you just um, select the lines you want to comment out, and then you can go to a menu and say comment out or whatever, and it'll put hashes in front of all of those. And then when you want to uncomment them, you can highlight all those lines and go and, and toggle that to uncomment all these lines. So good text editors or uh, code editors usually will do that. But the easiest way is to just put the text that you want to um, be ignored inside of single quotes. So we'll see examples of this later on, but I wanted to mention that. So I'm always a bit hesitant to jump into um, talking about object-oriented Python. And one of the reasons for that is it's kind of an advanced topic, but it's in a way it's sort of like importing uh, modules. It's very hard to get far in Python without having to deal with this. And one of the things that really confused me when I was first learning Python is that I would go to Google and say, how do you do blah, blah, blah in Python? And the examples that I would see had object-oriented code, or I wanted to use a particular feature, and that feature you have to use as an object. And so even if you don't like create objects or do your own object-oriented programming, it's useful to have a basic understanding of what's going on with object-oriented Python just because you're likely to use objects that are created by other um, people. So I think in one of the first lessons I mentioned that in uh, Python, basically everything is an object. So string variables are objects literal numbers or objects. But when we're talking about objects in this context, we're talking about um, sort of complex objects that we create ourselves that are not just built in objects that are a part of Python. And so I'm going to uh, start talking about objects in kind of an abstract way, and then we'll look at some more concrete examples. So you can think about a class as kind of an abstract category of things. So if you think about um, cars as a kind of thing, 
Um, so that idea, the concept of a car is different from any particular individual car. So, you know, I have a car that, um, well, I was going to say that I drive into work, except I'm not driving into work right now. But anyway, I have my own car, and that's a particular instance of the class of cars. So here you can see some, this sort of generic idea of a car. And then here you have particular cars, a red Ferrari, a white Volkswagen Beetle. Um, and so each of those particular uh, instances is what we call, uh, or each of those individual instances is what we call an instance of a class. And so we have this kind of strange word called instantiation, which basically means creating an instance of a class. That's the technical term for that. Now, one of the things that you'll notice, I think I mentioned in the first um, lesson that one of the ways you can name objects is this thing called camel case. So you start the first word with lowercase letter, and then if there are second or third words that you want to have be a part of the name of the object, you begin those with capital letters, and then you just jam all the words together. Well, the convention for classes of things generally is uh, to begin class names with a capital letter. And so that's actually kind of useful because you can tell a lot of times if you're, if you're talking about a class of something, it starts with a capital letter, but if you're talking about an instance of a thing, then usually it's lowercase. So we're not going to go into the details of how you define your own classes, because like I said, most of the time you're just going to use a class that's made by somebody else. Um, so this is like a tiny little snippet of code here that shows how you would define a class. And basically, um, you, you have this command called class, and then the name of the class, and then you have some, some code where you define uh, what the nature is of that class. So this is the definition of the class itself. And then when we want to create instances of the class, we just uh, give the class name, and then we take that class and we assign it into a variable. So here I have created an instance of the duck class called Donald and a second instance of the duck class called Daffy. So I'm instantiating two instances of ducks. Okay, so this is kind of a silly example because like what is a duck in terms of a computer? But anyway, you could get the idea of differentiating between the idea of what a duck is and the actual particular individual ducks. So um, the other thing is that uh, the, when you define what a class is, one of the ways you define uh, the class is by saying what its attribute, attributes are and what kind of methods you can do with that class. So an attribute is kind of like a characteristic of the class. Um, so for example, in the car, in the car example, that an attribute might be the color of the car. And then methods are essentially things that you can do with an instance of a class. So, you know, if, it, if we're talking about a car, something you can do with a car is to drive it or to put on the brakes or something like that. So if you want to think about it, essentially an attribute is a variable or a storage space that you can link to a an instance of a class and a method is basically a function that you can link to an instance of a class. So let's look at some particular examples. So um, let's say that I want to uh, talk about the colors of particular car instances. So here I have the name of this particular car. And notice it's starting with a lowercase letter, meaning that this is not cars in the abstract, but a particular car. And the attributes of the car, or the variables that are associated with the car, we link up to the instance by putting a dot between them and the name of the instance. So if I say Toyota Prius dot color equals blue, then I'm assigning blue to be the color attribute of that car. And here I'm assigning red as the color attribute of this car, 
and white as the color attribute of this car. And so in general, we can say that all instances of the class car can have that attribute color. So there are actually three different ways that we can set attributes. And we're going to look at examples of this in just a moment. Um, one of the ways that you can do it is to uh, create an instance of the class, like I did right here, and then manually assign the um, values of those attributes to the class instances uh, as like separate statements. But there's also two different ways that you can assign the values of the attributes at the time when you create the um, class instance itself. And I'm not going to go into the details of these because we're actually going to look at uh, separate examples of that. So what, which of these methods you can do to assign attributes to uh, values of attributes of, of the instances is going to depend on how the class is, uh, the class is defined. So let's go to the Colab notebook and um, we'll try some examples. So if you recall, uh, if you go to the vanderbilt.lt slash, um, let's see, okay, if you go to the lessons webpage and click on the third lesson, object-oriented Python, I hope I have set this up right, it says here, the examples in the lesson can be run in a Google Collaboratory notebook. Uh, now, when you do this, you might get a prompt that tells you to click on something to open Colab. Um, I already have Colab open, so it didn't ask me to do that. But what I'm going to do now is to go to the file menu and say, save a copy in Drive. So what it's doing now is it is has created a separate copy because the copy the copy that I shared with you um, I think you can run the cells but you can't actually save anything but if you've made a copy in your own um, notebook you should be able to uh, add and change the code yourself and save it so give me a little bit of feedback are you um, with me at this point are you able to get the collab notebook open I got it without trouble. Anybody else having any issues? Okay, well, I'm going to assume that silence means that you're with me. So here is the first example. And as I said, we're not going to worry about the details of how I define this class uh, duck. Um, but all you need to know is that I've defined the class duck. And one of the things that I've done, it, it, the, the duck class has three attributes, the name, the company it works for, and who its nemesis is. And in the way that I defined this class, I gave it default values. So if I don't change the values to something else, it's going to have these values right here. I've also created a um, function, and I call it a duck printing function, because you know, in the past we saw that when we passed arguments into um, a function, usually the argument was something like a, a, a string variable or a numeric variable, but we can pass a complicated object into a function uh, as an argument as well. So you're passing an entire duck along with all of its attributes into this function. And then the thing that it's going to do is to write out some stuff about the, the duck. So it'll say, my name is, and then here we see the, um, the uh, name of the duck, the company of the duck, and so on. So whatever we call our duck instance, it's going to print the name, the company it works for, and what the duck's nemesis is. Okay, so these are both in the sort of definition part of my code. Now here's the beginning of the actual script itself here. So I'm gonna create an instance of a duck, um, and that 
so I'm instantiating a duck and I'm calling it my duck. So this is a particular duck. And then I'm going to ask the script to tell me what is the name of the duck, the company of the duck, and the nemesis of the duck. So let's try running that. Okay, so notice that since I didn't uh, tell the script to use anything else, it's just using whatever the defaults are that I um, set. So if I wanted to make my duck have a different name, I could say my duck dot name equals Fred. Now if I run the script, I have changed the name of the duck to Fred. So we can manually change it like this. So the next script is um, sort of a continuation of this one. Since, so one of the things you should remember, this is true for both CoLab notebooks and also for Jupyter notebooks. Once you've run some code, the Python environment basically remembers what you've already done. So in my next code block, I don't need to redefine duck or redefine the duck printing function, it will remember what that is. So I can use any of those things. Um, so here I am using the input function, which we saw before. So it's gonna print on the screen, what is the duck's name, and then wait for me to type something. And then when I press enter, whatever I type is gonna be put in as the duck's name. Now let's think a little bit about what this code does here. This is, a cool little trick. So if you're doing an input statement and you just hit the enter key without typing anything, then you are entering a string, but it's a special string called the empty string. It's basically a string that has zero length and doesn't have any characters in it. So what I'm doing here is checking, did the person type in the empty string? In other words, did they just press the enter key without typing anything? That's either going to be true or false. So let's say that they did type something and this is false. Uh, or, and, and oh, sorry, I've, I've actually used this, which is the not equal um, operator. So if the thing that they typed in was not equal to nothing, then print the name. But if what they did was just typed in nothing, then I will not do what this says right here. So basically what this does is it avoids um, ha having uh, an error if the person doesn't type anything in. Uh, so let's, and then I ask what, uh, what, what company does the duck work for and who is the duck's nemesis? And then down here, I'm using that duck printing function, only now I'm passing my duck object into the, um, the function and it'll print some things about it. So you might remember from when we were talking about functions that there are essentially two ways that functions can work. They can uh, return a value and that value might, we could save that in a variable something or they can just do something. So this function here doesn't actually return any value. If we look at the definition uh, it doesn't, there's no return statement. All it does is it does something. It prints information about the duck. So let's go ahead and try running this. It's asking me, what is the duck's name? Let's say Johnny. Okay. Uh, who does, wow, why is it abbreviating this? Oh, maybe it's because I have my screen blown up a lot. I don't know. Who does a duck work for? Let's say he works for Disney. <clears throat> His nemesis is uh, the big bad armadillo. Okay, so, <clears throat> Um, okay, so I think I was sort of having a brain cloud here because um, <clears throat> what this line is actually doing <clears throat> is assigning what the person typed in to the, uh, 
the uh, attribute name. And so the logic of this is that if they didn't type anything in, we don't want to change the default value of name. We only want to set the attribute of the name if they actually type something, and that's what the code will do. So it says, my name is Johnny Duck. I work for Disney. My nemesis is the big bad armadillo. Now, if I run this code again, watch what happens if I um, don't type anything. So if I don't type anything for the company and just hit enter, and I don't say type anything for the nemesis, it says, ah, that's interesting. My name is Freddy Duck. I work for Disney. My nemesis is the big bad armadillo. So does anybody have any ideas why it did that? Well, remember that between running blocks of code, it remembers whatever it knew before. And so I set the value of these the last time I ran this block to be Disney and the Big Bad Armadillo, and it remembered that. Now, if I go up here and, um, and run this first block again, where I basically redefine duck and, and reset everything back to the default values. Now, if I run this code um, and I say, Freddy, but I don't put anything in for who Freddie works for, and I don't put anything, now it remembers the generic values that I set up here in the earlier code block. So basically, in a Jupyter notebook or in a Colab notebook, the notebook remembers the state of the um, attributes in between times when you click on the cells. Okay, well, that's kind of a lot of stuff. Does, uh, does anybody have any questions they want to ask about what we've done here so far? Hi, Steve. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. For this first block, that's where we um, put in the information, you know, my name is such and such duck. There's no way that kind of, that part of the sentence wouldn't print in the second block without us having done that first step. Exactly. So if you open the fresh Jupyter uh, or the fresh Colab notebook and just went straight to the second block, it would give you an error because it would say, well, first of all, it wouldn't know what the MyDuck object was because we never create, we never instantiated it. But it also, when you got to this print duck function, it would say something like unknown function because it only knows how to do that because we defined it here. Gotcha. That's a great, great question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, I got a question. Yeah. Well, what will happen if you run the first block first and then you refresh the page and then click the second block? Ah, uh, that is an interesting question. I, I don't actually, I, I've never tried doing that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. You could try doing it. Let's let's try running this. Okay, so we defined that. Let's refresh the page. Uh, hmm. Okay, now if we go down here. Oh, oops, I clicked on the wrong block, darn. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so here is the second block. I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Okay, so I think the situation is that you, um, you're you essentially working on like a cloud server. And so this particular session that we have here, the cloud server is basically remembering the uh, values of, of, that are in the environment. And so I guess the answer to the question is, it still remembers things even when you um, refresh the page. 
Now, if you close down, uh, well, this is a little different than Jupyter Notebook. In Jupyter Notebook, you can actually like shut down the server. And then I know if you do that, it's going to forget everything. I'm not, I haven't used Colab to know exactly how that works. Okay, great. Does anybody uh, have any other questions before we go on? Okay, so yeah, okay, I think we already talked about this. Oh, the last point here is actually a very important one. So you might ask like, why, why would we wanna go through all this hassle of creating like a duck instance? Like it doesn't really do anything useful, but one of the reasons for that is that if you associate variables with the instance like we did by making them be attributes, then those, variables essentially travel along with the duck. So for example, if you didn't have the color, if you didn't have the name, the nemesis, and the company as, uh, associated with the duck as attributes, you'd have to pass them in as three separate things into the function. But be, by uh, basically linking them up with the duck instance, then all we have to do is pass the duck into the function and then everything that's associated with that particular duck goes along with it into the function and we can then make use of them inside the function. So that's actually a very useful reason for making, um, for making a, uh, an object. Okay, so let's take a look at the second example. So in this example, um, we're doing the second method of uh, assigning attributes to an instance of a duck. And, the, and so this method, if we look down here at, we'll skip the, uh, we'll skip worrying about how we define the duck. And then this print duck function is exactly the same. We haven't changed anything. But the way we've set this up now, we can pass into the, um, as we are instantiating the duck, we can pass the attributes in during the creation process. So what we're doing here, the way this is set up, the first thing that we pass in is gonna be the name, the second thing is the company, and the third thing is the nemesis. So what we're doing here is we're saying, let's create an instance of a duck, and it's gonna, its name is gonna be Donald, Company Disney, and Nemesis Mickey Mouse. And then here's a second duck whose name is Daffy, et cetera, and a third duck named Roger. This fourth duck here, we don't pass anything in. So let's see what happens if we do that. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, run this. Okay, so. The second duck's company is Warner Brothers. Okay, that makes sense because we said the second thing we pass in is gonna be the company. The third duck's company is Wiley Coyote. Hmm. Wiley Coyote is not a company. That's a nemesis, right? That's like the guy who's always trying to kill Roadrunner. So why in this example did it assign Wiley Coyote as the company when I actually wanted it to be the nemesis. Um, anybody have any ideas about that? Because it's in the second position. Exactly. So one of the downsides of using this method is what happens if you don't provide values for each of the um, attributes that you're passing in? If, if you only pass in two and it's one in three, then it will not complain. It'll just simply uh, pass the second thing in as the second uh, attribute and then leave the third one as, uh, as it is. So if I say um, third duck nemesis, You can see it says an unknown enemy because that was what we said to use uh, as the default if, uh, if it doesn't know what else to do. And if I, um, yeah, so anyway, I, the same thing would hold true with this generic duck. 
he's ba basically um, going to just have all the default values. All right, so if I just do that, it's just gonna say my name is Duck, my friend, default name, hates an unknown enemy. <laughs> okay, that's kind of dumb. So the way that we can get around this is by defining our function in a different way. And again, we won't worry about how this duck was uh, defined and also the print duck function is exactly the same. But the way that uh, in this method, we pass the values in as key value pairs. And so um, we say the, the key, which is basically the name of the attribute, and then we say what value we want to be associated with that. And so now in this example where we had the problem before, we're specifically saying we want Wiley Coyote to be the nemesis, even though it's in the second position. And the fact that I've left out company here just means that company is gonna get assigned the default um, value. So if we run this code block, we'll see that it worked the way we wanted it to. Since we didn't put in any value for company here, it says third duck's company is a generic company, which is the value that it has if we don't change it to something else. Um, okay, so that's uh, the third way of doing that. So let's talk about, um, uh, let's see, okay, yeah, we just did that. Okay, cool. So let's talk about methods. So a method, as I said before, is kind of like a function that's associated with instances of a class. So just as an ex going back to the car example, we could have a method called drive, okay? And this would be an example of a, a method or a function that doesn't actually return anything, it just does something. So if I apply the drive method to my car, what it does is it drives, it doesn't return anything, it does something. Uh, here's an example, if I said accelerate by 15, then that means like speed up by 15 miles an hour, and then it's going to uh, return a value of like whatever the new speed is of the car. So um, in the same way that, after, that we put attributes after the instance name connected by a dot, we do the same thing with methods. Uh, so let's see an example of this. So I've created this kind of, uh, well, a little bit silly um, poetry example that you can play around with. And um, so again, you don't have to worry about how this works, but um, it creates a default poem, which is an awesome poem that I wrote myself. Um, and you'll see what that is in a minute. And then this poem, uh, so it has a default text, a default title, and a def default language. And then it also has several methods. So one of the methods is called um, lines. And what it does is shows you all the lines in the poem. And then there's one that shows you all the words in the poem. And there's one that shows you all the stanzas in a poem. Uh, and then the last one which is my favorite one, abuses the poem by replacing words that are in the poem with other words that you want. Um, and then this part of the code here, uh, in case you're not interested in using my default stupid poem, you can actually use Robert Frost's poem, Stopping by Woods in a Snowy Evening, which has been assigned to uh, a variable called Frost Text. Okay, so let's play around with this a little bit. So here's the beginning of the actual script here. So I'm creating an instance of poem and, because, and remember the default is gonna be my stupid poem. And then we're gonna say, okay, what's the title of my stupid poem? What's the text of my stupid poem? And then show me all the lines in the poem. And the last one we'll come back to in a minute. Okay, so let's try running that. Okay, so here's my awesome poem stopping by towns where the woods used to be. 
the woods is down, they build a town, this is my text by default, so I must come to a halt. So uh, the, then I do the method, the lines method, which does not require you to pass anything in. It, sometimes a method requires you to input something, just like a function, but this is a, a method that just does something uh, to the poem, it counts up the number of lines and then returns, or it doesn't count the number of lines, it breaks the poem into lines and then it returns a data structure called a list. We haven't actually learned about lists, this is our topic for next week, but a list is square brackets and then each item in the list is separated by commas. So you can see here basically, here's each of the different lines. And then I said I would um, come back to the last thing. So he, here is the um, a method that breaks a poem up into words. So it gives you a list of all the words in the poem. And then remember when we were talking about strings, we could use the length function to count how many letters were in the string. Well, we can also use the length fu function to count how many of items there are in a list. And since this list is a list of all the words in the poem. If I ask what the length is, it will tell it will count up all of the words that were in this list of words and tells me that there are 22 um, things there. Okay, uh, so we can, um, let's see, I think the next thing to do, yeah, okay. Let's try, um, uh, instead of um, using the stupid poem, let's assign the value of um, So I'm going to take, I'm taking this text here of the Robert Frost poem and I'm assigning that as the text of the stupid poem. Now if I run this, uh, oh look, here's the actual real poem. Although it still is called Stopping by Towns Where the Woods Used to Be. Why is that? Uh, it's because I didn't change the title here. I could say, okay, I didn't capitalize it, but okay. So I've changed the title attribute. I've changed the text. Now it's gone through and broken it into lines and it's counted the number of words, which are 108. Okay, so the last uh, thing which we haven't tried doing is um, we have not uh, tried the abuse function. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna do here is um, this, function called deep copy is something that I would really rather not get into, but I have to tell you about it at this point. In the past, if we had a variable that contained a simple object like a number or a string, we could assign its value into another variable and we'd just get a copy of that variable. But if you have a complicated object, like a user-defined object like this poem, or complicated objects like lists, which we're gonna talk about next week, and you just simply use the assignment operator, it doesn't actually make a separate copy. It just refers to the original copy. And so if you mess around with what you think is a copy of the original object, you're actually changing the original object itself. And in this case, maybe we don't wanna change the original object. So using this deep uh, copy, um, function, which is a part of the copy module. Um, so the copy module is a, one of the built-in modules to um, Python. And so I'm saying copy module and then the 
the deep copy function. So it's going to actually really make a copy of my stupid poem. And then I can assign a new uh, title to the poem and I can uh, change the words everywhere where it says woods, I'm going to change it into swamp. So let's try that. Uh, okay, I forgot to say. Even though it's a part of the standard library, I still have to import it. Let's try that. Okay, there we go. All right, so every place in the poem where the word woods occurred, it has substituted the word swamp. Uh, that is kind of an abuse of this beautiful poem, isn't it? All right, so anyway, you can play around with this. Um, you can try uh, changing horse into dragon. Let's try that. My little dragon must think it queer to stop with that. Okay, all right. Anyway, you can play around with this and try doing it yourself. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up here um, by talking about, um, this is actually something that was in one of the um, examples um, that, uh, or, or in one of the uh, challenge problems where you could try to create a, um, a graphical interface. And um, so the thing that's interesting about this, like so far we've created actually pretty dumb, useless things like ducks and abusing poems and things like that. But like what is an example of a class of a real kind of thing that you might want to do? Um, let's see, I forgot to, let's see. No, it's not there. Hmm. I forgot to load up TK Enter. Oh, wait, no, that's not what I want. Tawny, sorry. There we go. So one of the problems with the uh, the visual code is that um, you can't uh, the the code that makes uh, objects that are um, that use the screen properties is that they won't work inside of um, inside of the Colab notebook. So what I've done here, okay, I did that kind of fast. I went back to the lesson web page and clicked on this uh, GUI Lati Maker with surprise button. This is like the most complicated one. So if we look at this code here, we can see that um, I here is an example. Let's see, let me make this bigger. Here is an example where I am instantiating something called called a TK. Well, a TK is basically a computer window. And then it has an attribute, uh, sorry, it has a method called title, which assigns the string that you pass to it as the title of the window. And then it does a bunch of other stuff. Uh, it, um, so there is a, um, a, um, object that you can create within the window called label objects. There are button objects, there are input box objects. So what this code does is creates instances of a whole bunch of things that you would actually see in a graphical interface of a computer program. And so instead of just being a random stupid thing like a imaginary duck, this actually creates real objects that you can use like buttons and so on. So what I'm gonna do is um, select all of this code, copy it, and I hope this is gonna work. Let's paste it into Thani and then run it. 
So this is a, a little bit small, but you can see that um, I've created a graphical interface. And remember in this uh, title line, I assigned the title of it to be Latte Maker, and that's the title that shows up here. And then these are uh, text boxes, objects, and then these are two little button objects. And so if I um, tell it to make me a latte, oh, I have to have Bonnie here. Okay, so one of the deficiencies of this is there's a graphical interface for selecting what you want and clicking on buttons, but the output still shows up here. And so actually a part of one of the challenge problems for this week is to see if you can hack this code to insert an object called a scrolling window. And so you can, this, um, this window object here, you can actually add another object called a scrolling window. And then when you click these buttons, it'll be sort of like a, a cash register tape or whatever that scrolls and then the lattes that you make, instead of showing up in the, sh the um, shell window here, they'll actually show up on here. But anyway, one of the cool things of this latte maker is if you click surprise me, it'll, it'll select random beans and milk and flavoring and, and give you a decaf fat vanilla latte or a regular fat vanilla latte. Or you can say, what you want yourself. So it says regular skinny latte if I put those things in. So anyway, this is just an example of a situation where the objects that you make are actual real useful things like a window and buttons and stuff like that. And just like what we talked about, they have attributes except for like a window. It, one of the attributes might be how many pixels wide it is or an attribute of the button might, uh, or a method of the button might be what happens when you click that button and so on. So anyway, like I said, this is kind of an advanced topic, but um, if you want to uh, use code that other people have written, like this code for creating a graphic interface, you have to sort of have some basic understanding of, of what objects are. And, um, the nice thing about this code is that you can basically look at this code here and see like, oh, here's where you set what it says in that one box. You can go in here and change these things and then just go down to the bottom and change a few lines of code and you can essentially um, hijack the graphical interface and create it uh, your own, a graphical interface for your own program. All right, so that's, we're basically out of time for today. Uh, again, I would encourage you, um, if you're able, to um, try to at least uh, work on the homework problem. So one of the, so the homework problem basically uses the, um, the poem object that I created, that code, and then you can try doing things using the different methods and so on. Um, and then here is the challenge problem that I mentioned, which is to basically take that code that I showed you, and then here's kind of a walkthrough on things you can add to the code to make it have a scrolling text output. So anyway, if you're looking for a challenge, uh, that might be a fun kind of thing to try to do for next week. So, um, so we're out of time. I'm going to go ahead and um, turn off recording, but I'm going to stick around for a while so that if anybody um,